Cody Alarcón, I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan, um, and I'm co-leading this um, guest speaker series with my colleague Mona El Café at UVA. Um, as you all know, at this point in the semester, uh, this is a joint uh, lecture series that we are curating as part of uh, our two seminars. In the case of the University of Michigan, is the theories and methods uh, of urban design. And I want to say uh, we are really excited to be here uh, tonight with, uh, with our guests. I'm going to um, give Mona the opportunity to introduce herself and, and her class, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good evening, everyone, and hello, Jose. Um, we are really excited that you're with us tonight. Uh, my name is Mona al -Kafif. I'm an associate professor at UVA and the director of our urban design programs. Um, as, as Maria said, this semester we started an exciting collaboration, um, which basically uh, generated um, a lecture series with seven lectures. Um, we are already halfway through the semester. And while working on the, the larger umbrella topic, we were um, thinking about um, what urban design as a larger uh, and more diverse interpretation of the discipline or the bridge discipline can contribute to the uh, increasing urbanization of our planet, basically. Um, we were thinking a lot about what are the niche activities that urban designers or designers can take on and came very quickly uh, up with a list of ambitious designers, theorists, scholars, uh, and colleagues who occupy niche spaces that are taking on the agenda of the urban, uh, but not necessarily through an assignment that might be provided to them, and also not necessarily through the classic scale, scale of the master plan, for example. So these projects that we are presenting in this lecture series are um, have something in common. They are all realizations in one form or the other. The question is if the realization and the one-to-one -one project is in form of a physical project, in form of a digital project, uh, in form of a permanent or a temporary project. Um, we um, created a kind of uh, set of questions that uh, allow these uh, different projects and very diverse projects to be also compared with each other. And I'm handing it over to Maria to talk us uh, quickly through the, uh, the guiding questions that all presenters received. So at this point in the semester, we are all familiar with these uh, six, um, you know, uh, points of uh, common discussion, common sharing in between all our guests. We have been asking them to actually uh, share with us uh, how they see their design agency through the projects that they share with us. This is very much about um, the many roles, the many ways in which we are designers can um, place our work into our work into the world from projects that are solving problems, others who are defining problems, uh, from um, this notion of the um, project as a way of reading the city and possible ways forward to other approaches that are more interested in, in theorization and uh, critical approaches to, to the urban realm. We are very much interested in actions, in you know what, what is the shape that uh, these projects are taking. We have been learning from projects that are um, provocating, others are anticipating, others are very much about healing, about empowering partners, about, you know, very carefully and tactically um, repairing, and others are all about, you know, innovation and testing new approaches. The question about uh, methods, you know, or how important it is, um, how, how do we work and how do con how do we conduct our um, research approaches uh, to also learn from, from the work that we are developing? And then similarly, how we actually um, articulate who do we work with, who do we work for, and you know, who do we, in a way, uh, bring our projects into conversation? This is about partners, this is about the stakeholders, this is about larger coalitions, all about pushing beyond the boundaries of the traditional client as the main um, as the main stakeholder and um, to be able to to develop our projects last we have been asking a lot of questions about uh, funding how are the projects taking place and uh, what are the, the sources coming from and what that all means for projects that are very much grounded in, in 
building collectivities and, and new approaches to the commons. And last but not least, there has been a pretty robust conversation about how we talk about replication, about the scaling up the projects, about transferability, what is in between the site specific to the prototypical and what are the values and the challenges that each one of the projects uh, present. So these are some of the ways in which we are trying to establish relationships and, and see how different ways of practicing and theorizing um, urban work today are in a way um, helping us to establish uh, relationships. And Mona, we cannot hear you. Okay, sorry. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that happened. Sorry, my Karim has to cut this out of the video. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, established a whole lecture series and today we are with Jose Sanchez. There are two remaining lecturers afterwards. And maybe just as a note, Nada Nafe will be with us on Wednesday and not Thursday next week, uh, calling in from Cairo uh, at an earlier time than the evening slot. Um, I wanna hand it over now to our team of students who are moderating the evening. Uh, Sarah and Jan are joining us from, uh, from Michigan and Kaoming, Shindran and Vina are joining us from UVA. And as in earlier uh, evenings and sessions, students are introducing our speaker and are also prepared a set of questions and will later on also moderate the questions that are coming from their peers to have an encouraged dialogue and discussion at the end of the presentation. And with this, I'm handing it over to the student moderators. Thank you. And Karim and Ishan, again, thank you so much for taking care of all of the technology that is a part of these presentations. Okay. Um, hello. Let me make a brief introduction to the Jose Sanchez. Um, Jose Sanchez is an architect, game designer, and theorist based in Detroit, Michigan. He is the director of the Plasera project, a research studio investing in the future of the propagation of architectural design knowledge. He is the author of the book, Architecture for the Commons, Participatory Systems in the Age of Platforms, published by Rutledge in 2020, and the co-creator of Bloom, a crowdsourced interactive installation, which was the winner of the Wonder Series hosted by the City of London for the 2012 Olympics. He is currently at the University of Michigan, where he is an associate professor at the Topman College School of Architecture. He is also the creator of the video games Blockhood and Commonhood, digital social platforms that add the authoring of architectural and ecological thinking to non-expert audiences. So Blackhood is a city building simulator video game that focuses on ideas of ecology, interdependence and decay. The game invites players to invasion the neighborhood by building structures out of a catalog of more than 200 blocks. The game is both an educational and research initiative exploring the connection between games and architecture, contributing to a form of digital infrastructure for the ecological and system thinking that is necessary in contemporary urbanism. Blockhood also is an award-winning city building simulator. So now please join me in welcoming Jose Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I wanna start by thanking uh, Mona and Maria for you know, the opportunity to, to speak uh, with you today. Um, and I certainly wanna extend a great uh, thanks to the University of Michigan team that has made an extra effort, especially to Ishan Felsing, who is currently uh, has managed to, to make this, this fantastic presentation uh, work, and Anya Sirota and Jacob Comerci, who have been uh, really kind of uh, trying to push what uh, University of Michigan is doing in regards to the communication um, on delivering content beyond the, the kind of the Zoom uh, backgrounds that we're doing every day. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to try this experiment uh, and, and let's see how that goes, right? Um, so maybe we could start a uh, next slide. Um, so I wanna start by uh, sharing my, my ideas about what I'm being 
calling platform realism and, and perhaps start with this idea of the affordance of realism. Next, next slide. Um, I recently moved to the city of Detroit. I'm originally a Chilean architect. Uh, and in Detroit, I was able to experience the beautiful murals of Diego Rivera. Um, and next slide. Um, the work of Diego Rivera in many ways resonates uh, very profoundly on, on, on my own interest in depicting the human body, simulating systems of labor. Next slide. Um, and then I started kind of connecting my work in many ways uh, to the legacy of you know, Mexican painters as, such as Jose Clemente Orozco or David Alfredo Siqueiros. Um, next slide. And understanding how the legacy of some of these muralists, especially looking at utilizing a medium such as the mural uh, was also influential for some of the work, of, for instance, of, of American artists such as Elizabeth Catlett and many others. Um, next slide. For me, uh, this kind of work that uh, embraces certain forms of realism uh, was a contingent and very important work uh, that emerged in a particular period of time. And in many ways, I feel like we are living through a period of time that requires uh, a similar approach to kind of bring forward some of the, the challenges of, that we're facing. Next slide. Um, through this uh, perspectives of uh, systemic racism, but also inequality and in many levels, I think that there is a, a reality that should not be um, not acknowledged. Next slide. As a Chilean architect, uh, I come from a very specific uh, background that it's also under a, a kind of a cr uh, important crisis. We are actually going through uh, a change of a constitution, a process that has been a, a series of social uprisings that, you know, has a uh, called for a change of a constitution with a great degree of approval. And I think that it's an interesting point for the Chilean people to really think what a constitution for the 21st century, well, how does a 21st century constitution look like? Next slide. Um, so yeah, I am actually someone as a Chilean that is participating on the process as I think every Chilean is to, to consider what does a new constitution look like. Um, next slide. And here we can just maybe go quickly through some of these, these references, I think. Uh, I, I want to think and with, I, would, I work with students to think about how do we think the right to privacy uh, when we look at social media platforms, as, as has been pointed out by Shoshana Zuboff, or rethinking how do we think about access, next slide, um, as well. Uh, our right to housing, as some of my students have been reflecting uh, issues of property, uh, the right of native populations, the exploitation of common resources. And let me maybe just stay in this one. I think that um, it hasn't been a coincidence, I think that uh, Chilean groups, for instance, the, the group Por Una Vida Justo, Por Una Vida Digno, has used the mural, has used this kind of large scale representation drawings to connect to the public, to really embrace uh, art, and, but also in a, in a carry a message, a form of realism that depicts, in this case, is showing the size of uh, some of the social housing uh, that is happening within within the current uh, uh, practices in Chile um, to really connect and empathize with what is really going on socially. Next slide. So next slide as well. Um, we can, uh, I, I just finished a book called The Architecture for the Commons. And I wanted to kind of quickly give you a, a glimpse again, and, and this is something we can go relatively quickly um, of some of the ideas in the book. Um, the book reflects upon um, what we consider architectural progress. And I think that for quite some time, I, I, I studied in the AA under Patrick Schumacher. And I think that there's an idea of progress of, for at least a group of architects, there's an idea of progress that has been associated with, uh, with form and the production of more and more uh, challenging forms and have more freedom in form. But in many ways, I think that that project has run its course, and it's certainly not uh, really offering us avenues uh, forward. Um, I, I spend quite a bit of time really going deeper into a critique of parametrics, if you want, through a chapter that I call the coalescence of parts, and understanding how we slowly start uh, losing a sense of, uh, or access to uh, participating in the construction process when buildings become more and more coalesced or, or really are, are kind of centralized through a process of vertical integration. 
So in many ways, what I do in the book is, is a defense of parts, thinking that parts do give us an avenue for a pluralistic uh, multi-actor economy, one in which uh, participants either through uh, sweat equity and labor can participate and contribute. Um, I see my own work uh, as in a tectonic level and as an architectural level, as an exploration of a port, part to whole relationships, celebrating parts and their distributed capacities. But also um, I consider that digital platforms are an opportunity to um, recombine, consider the, the, the potential of social combinatorics in architecture. Um, so, Social combinatorics, this is um, perhaps the larger umbrella uh, that I use to, uh, to understand my work that sometimes is physical, uh, physical forms of architecture. And in many cases, some of the biggest projects uh, have to do with digital platforms and social platforms in the, in the form of video games. So I wanna show you briefly some projects that led me to, to start thinking in this way uh, with the first project, which is in the next slide, it's called Bloom, which is was mentioned in the introduction. Um, I think that we have an, an issue with the slide or order. Are we jumping ahead? Oh, interesting. I think that, um, yeah, I think that you're, uh, we're, we are kind of jumping to the video game common hood. Um, I had a, the Bloom project first, but we, we, can, we can improvise a little bit. Um, please go ahead and then with what you. Perfect, that's good. No problem. Um, yeah, so I, I think that I, I like going in this order because Bloom for me was really a, a point of departure to really connect a, something like a, like a toy, right? Like next slide uh, shows how a simple unit, a part, it could embed certain rules, certain logics, and but in a way uh, be thought of something that could grow, right? It had the seats for something larger. Next slide. Uh, it defines a rule system, uh, and this is kind of coming really from my background of you know programming and understanding generative systems. But in a way, the interesting move of this project, you can see in the next slide, is the moment that we open the system to a social system. Right, there's a coupling of of, of logics here. One being uh, a logic of an architect, a designer that wants to kind of uh, create this installation in the world, but also a social system that really adopts and kind of transforms, bends, breaks certain rules to kind of make it relevant and meaningful for a particular instance. Next slide. Um, another project that I've explored, uh, some physical, you know, uh, tectonics uh, is the foliage project, um, which next slide shows how simple standardized elements. Um, some of the, the theories that I describe in the book about discrete architecture talks about how small components that perhaps inexpensive components that could be serialized could allow for a large permutation uh, and variability of systems, right? So it's not about just making parts incredibly uh, complex and unique as the theories of non-standard architecture perhaps led us to believe, but rather kind of thinking of inexpensive parts that have a multiplicity of connections. So we designed a part, as you can see in the next slide, that allows, next slide, a, and here you can go quickly again through these slide, slides. Um, and we, we kind of serialize the production of these parts that they basically determine how simple, simple standardized pieces of wood uh, are oriented, right? So you can see here, that the orientation of wood elements is uh, fundamentally determined by this kind of small joint, a serialized piece of like inexpensive steel joinery. And we have uh, eventually created a tectonic system, a space frame, if you want, that grows out of uh, such a logic, right? So the organization of the material is what leads to a series of possible outcomes. And here's there's some renders and images that we provided as how can this system adapt and transform and in many cases, when architecture starts becoming uh, 
you know, more uh, it starts growing in scale, it's difficult to think that this would actually be a game uh, and people would be able to play with these pieces. But um, I really think of these projects also as a toy. So we actually created a miniature toy version of the project um, together with a series of instructions that would help anybody to combine and, and learn what you can do with the system, but also allow for someone playing with the system to expand upon it and perhaps, again, bend or break the rules. Maybe stay in, in this slide for a second. Um, and we also envision that such digital or the, the recombination of parts could happen at a much more global scale through the engagement of video games, right? And this is an image of the game Common Hood that I'm gonna show at the end of this presentation. But there was already a, um, an intuition of trying to connect physical systems and digital systems. How do we allow crowds to um, iterate and tinker with the possibilities and in a way add meaning and value to the patterns, the data arrangements that define one configuration from another one, right? Um, I think that there was a contribution of how parts become um, the building blocks, but the patterns are something that in a way emerge locally and contingently uh, when, when, when engaging the social system. So I'm gonna move to the next slide. So with that in mind, um, I hope that this kind of really sets up the stage of what, how I, I got to games. Some people say, hey, Jose, you're working on games and architecture, but the games was, has been more of a, an answer to a question of how do, we, how do we allow certain social systems to interact and participate on a process of, of form making and the definition of what forms we ought to be making, right? Um, and I describe games as explicit bias, and I'm gonna try to unpack that a little bit as we go. Maybe we move to the next few slides. Uh, so the, the idea of a platform is something that is central. Um, as a, as a, as a, it has, been, has become central as a body of study in my work. Um, as I think that we are living through the age of platforms, people like Nick Chernicek talk about platform capitalism, Shoshana Zubov talk about surveillance, uh, uh, surveillance capitalism. Um, and in many ways, next slide, uh, today, uh, the most powerful entities in the world uh, are associated with this network infrastructure that is capable not only to, to understand who their users are, but also perhaps, as Shoshana mentions, uh, persuade and, and you know, uh, alter the behavior of its users. So um, next slide. Uh, in many ways, we've seen examples of how democracy has also been challenged by, you know, in this case, and the whistleblower Christopher Wiley uh, revealing the kind of the, the what, what Cambridge Analytica had been able to do having access to, to the Facebook network. And next. And other people like cyberpunks, uh, including people like Julian Assange, have been warning us for this and, and giving us directions of what are those technologies, perhaps cryptography, and how do we kind of uh, protect privacy? How do we how do we become citizens of uh, a world that has become fundamentally led by digital platforms. Next slide. Um, in many ways, uh, platforms define if we remember or not authorship, uh, ownership, right? In many, many times I see myself running through Pinterest and, and, and not necessarily taking enough attention of referencing or kind of citing who are the people that I'm actually being influenced by. And I think that some of that practice uh, really kind of forgets very quickly uh, where value potentially came from. And I think that we, we ought to be designing better platforms to keep track of that. Um, next slide. Someone like Ted Nelson has been mentioned by Jaron Lanier in his, uh, one of his books, uh, has created data structures that, that try to keep track and create ledgers that uh, maintain the memory of a network, meaning that our networks do not have a memory by default. And uh, that needs to be done by design. We want to design networks that have a different uh, protocol for interaction between users, right? So the, the process of designing a platform is fundamentally defining what are the protocols of and what are the rules by which we want to be engaging with each other as humans. Um, next slide. Uh, issues like the Creative uh, Commons license especially has certain attributions that I, I find very interesting, things like the share-like uh, attribution, the idea of allowing remixing, right? How do you 
take content that has been created by someone else, remix it, uh, combine it in a different way and, and share it yet again. Um, that process for me is fundamental to really think that there could be a proliferation of value and, and, and content being produced by users. Next slide. And then who owns the platform? Who has, um, I think that people like Trevor Schultz have been leading a conversation about how do we think of platforms, not as a surveillance platform or a surveillance technology, but perhaps one uh, for cooperation, right? And I think that that puts an emphasis on that the design of the platform fundamentally changes the rules by which the platform operates. Next slide. So, so these are some of the considerations that make me think, well, if architecture would be designing a platform, uh, would be conceiving of a platform, what would be the, the challenges, right? And, and what are potentially some, some of the solutions or suggestions that people have put forward. Um, next slide. I think in architecture, we, we don't have a platform yet. Uh, and, and I think it's gonna happen. Um, we have things like, you know, um, um, sketch uh, the 3D warehouse uh, archives of SketchUp uh, models, or we use Instagram for image collection. Next slide. Or, or wonderful projects that I admire deeply, like WikiHouse or the Open Building Institute, um, use GitHub or, or other kind of platforms that are fundamentally not catered for architecture to really kind of uh, propagate their 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 material. Um, but I think that it's it's certainly games, as we can see. Next slide. Um, a medium that is very well equipped for generation of content, for the propagation of content, for the tinkering of content. This is images from the Sims, and which has a very robust kind of set of building tools, very much catered for non-expert experts, and certainly not interested in, uh, fundamentally not interested in architecture. There's kind of a whole different discourse of affordances of this, this engine. Next slide. Um, so for quite some time, since 2013 or so, I've been you know, researching on games and architecture to really reflect upon how games could become a form of social media platform and, and under which principles such platforms should be designed. Next slide. So that really takes me to uh, my first video game project, um, which I started once I moved from London to Los Angeles. I started the, the video game Blockhood. Uh, that was my first video game. Um, next slide. And maybe we could move towards the, the video I think here, which is uh, great, thank you. Um, so, so Blockhood, just to, to give you a, a bit of a context for the project, um, Blockhood is a, it's a city building simulator. Uh, it it's sits into a tradition of city building games such as SimCity uh, or City Skylines. And it really tries to reflect of how would these games would be designed if they were not uh, done from the perspective of the economy, but perhaps from an ecological perspective. What this means is that uh, the game doesn't really charge you for producing new tiles, for producing new forms in architecture, but rather uh, challenges the player to keep uh, the designs uh, alive, if you want, right? Like um, the game really uses the analogy of a beating heart, right? Everything that you create within the game needs to be sustained. Um, trees will need to be provided water um, and commerce is gonna be requiring customers in many ways, right? So that every tile, creates a dependency to other tiles, right? So as, as it was mentioned in the introduction, the, the game has over 200 tiles and it's really trying to think what are, what are the possible tiles that a city block can actually have and how those tiles define interdependencies with one another, right? So the first mechanic that the game really plays with is this idea of interdependence and the inputs and outputs that come from one tile to the next. So the player is not really forced or challenged to do anything in particular. It's, it really, it's your own imagination what defines what you want to do with the game. Um, but it's through the addition of any tile in the system that you will realize that tile will require certain dependencies. And that starts motivating and starts escalating into uh, larger and larger constructions, right? So it's a game that many people have uh, described as something very relaxing, that you work at your own pace, there's no kind of a narrative that leads you to, to work through the game. But at the same time, it starts getting more and more difficult because you have to match your own ambitions, right? Like the more you wanna build, the more you have to sustain and you have to figure out. And 
the idea of block code is to really maintain within the city block um, all the dependencies that you might have. I think that we, we've grown used to think that waste management, for instance, is something that you could externalize or energy production will come from somewhere else. But in block code, you have to take care of all those things within your city block, right? So uh, it really kind of fundamentally closes an idea of, of, of an externality, right? So you have to produce your own food, you have to manage your own waste, and you have to manage the consequences of some of your decisions, right? So that could be in the form of pollution, that could be in the form of a, you know, a smelly neighborhood or something like that, right? And you're not just passing that problem to someone else through the virtue of being able to pay for it, right? So, so that's kind of one of the realizations that the player is invited to have. It's like, what, what does it mean to really uh, start thinking of uh, taking a, a profound responsibility for the systems that we are dependent on? Um, maybe we can, I think that we, that there's enough of the video already. We can move to the next slide. Uh, so next. Next one. So this is an image of the early prototype of the game that I developed with Satoru Sujihara and Sergio Irigoyen. Um, next slide. And here again, we can go a little bit faster uh, or maybe next slide, we can stop for one second on this one. So this is a diagram of how um, the interdependence of resources works within block, right? We, we can imagine that every tile is interdependent with each other. Next slide and how um, you can actually create a supply chain, right? Meaning that you might have some industrial food production system that requires a dependency between um, certain uh, concentrated feeding operations per perhaps on uh, or GMO farms. And then next slide, uh, you could actually compare that of what would it be like maybe an organic food production system and the kind of resources that would be moved around that supply chain perhaps and the different yields that those could produce. Next slide. The game is fundamentally working on the, on the principle of synergies and proximities, like each tile kind of understands what's happening around it. Next slide. And, and the player is presented uh, information in a, in a whole series of forms, uh, understanding production data, access data structure, uh, in order to achieve a design. Next slide. Next slide. Um, the result of common hood, um, many, many people always ask me, it's like, is there a kind of a way of beating the game? Is there a winning state? And I think that my, my notion of a game, it's not perhaps under the, the tradition of winning or losing, but perhaps really designing um, different patterns, different kind of arrangements that might be meaningful or valuable to a particular context, right? And in this case, we're, we're starting to talk about the player's agency. I, I'm part of the designer of a team that, um, that is thinking of the game structure, but I don't, I'm not the player. And the player has the agency to define its own series of uh, their own value system. Um, and that's very important. It's just not to impose a value system for in the, pre, in the production of my software uh, and, and the games that I produce, there's no value system that is uh, imposed, but there's kind of a multiplicity. It's, it's more of what are the options that how we can think through the variables, through the options. And, and certainly in many cases, players expand upon those. And I wish that I'm still kind of researching on how to open up further the engine that players can further expand what is possible with the system. So next few slides, maybe we can move through those. Um, the fundamental objective of the game is really to create an open-ended system, one that can yield a multiplicity of results. And even in these diagrammatic forms, uh, these forms would be the result of players' intentions. Um, looming on, on the opposite end of these forms are also the idea of decay, uh, as you know, we're kind of the game mechanic of maintaining a healthy building is, is central. Maybe stop in, in this slide for a second. The game has a component um, that has to do with narrative. Um, and that came much later in the production of the project. And, and I mention it now because it has really become a central feature or uh, the point of departure of my next project, Common Food, which I'm going to share with you in a second. Um, and I initially, I never understood what narrative had to offer. 
but in many ways I started understanding that uh, the production of computational thinking, um, which I I'm, I'm, felt like I've been always part of in, in the discipline of architecture, has always been operating in a, in a vacuum, has been operating under abstraction. Uh, the, the empty environments of something like Rhino or Maya uh, are not populated with stories or the constraints or the challenges that we see socially. And it is perhaps certain layers of narrative, certain layers of constraints that we see in the real world that have not been bound in the digital yet. So um, that has been a reflection that I have been carrying towards the development of my next video game, Common Hood, um, which I wanna share with you in a second. But next slide, um, just to conclude in the Blockwood project, uh, as much as we have been doing certain workshops and activities in schools and educational initiatives, there's nothing like the online activities that uh, the game can achieve through um, an online global engagement. And I think that that has been the power of, of video games that I see has, has to do with their capacity to scale to a global audience and, and really connect people that might be uh, from widely different ages and different cultures to contribute to a, a design process uh, that could be for a specific locality. Next slide. And next slide. So with that, um, Okay, so here I think we go back to the yeah, common food. Um, I want to start uh, discussing the common food project. Um, so Blockwood is a project that took me uh, around maybe three or so years to to develop. I started uh, very much on my own. Um, you know, I'm someone that that uh, initially uh, in school I started learning how to program and and started doing small simulations, and then Blockwood became my my main project working through. Um, this software development challenge, right? Um, but it definitely grew. I, I want to thank obviously all the team that participated in that project. And it, it grew to the point of, of really becoming also a new project, Common Food, which, uh, if you go to the next slide, has also a, a large team of people that I'm, I'm thankful uh, that are working behind. And, and I cannot thank you all enough for your contribution on this project. Um, next slide. Uh, so maybe here we can play the video of Common Food. So this is um, this video is a little bit of a trailer, uh, something that we, we released recently. The game hasn't been released yet. Um, and it very much has a very different point of departure. As you can see here, uh, the game features a narrative. Uh, a main character, Nikki, uh, she's been evicted from her home and she ends up as a squatter, part of a... Um, a community of squatters living in an abandoned factory. There's a, no, a lot of symbolism on this uh, occupation. And it has to do with the failed dreams of progress that uh, a, genera a different generation had. And, and Nikki represents a new generation that uh, is ought to be thinking about uh, how to kind of rise, how do you create wealth in a neighborhood uh, with a certain, perhaps a different a series of ideals, right? Um, so you are invited in the game to uh, build your own uh, tools, build your own or uh, slowly access different forms of tools and start thinking of design uh, fundamentally mediated by the lens of scarcity, right? It's imagine you have a 3D building environment and you don't have infinite lines. You have a limited amount of lines or in this case pieces of of materials and wood and, and concrete and, and metal to work with. And you have to be very purposeful of what you do with those materials. Um, so that's kind of the premise for the game. You are uh, occupying this abandoned factory and you're creating kind of a thriving community within it, always with the, uh, the threat of being evicted again. You are in, in, many, in many ways occupying illegally this space uh, and in a way, so the kind of antagonist of the game has to do um, this, this kind of the precarity of this um, of this occupation that is not uh, formal in, under a legal framework. So um, this is something that, in a way, is carried by the narrative, the narrative of the characters. Uh, in many ways, the game wants to reflect upon notions of labor, notions of organization and collectivization of of a, projects and, and how do players engage, not through commanding um, 
other kind of characters in the game, but rather kind of uh, creating trust within a community. So next slide. The game presents the question, where is architecture conceived? And that takes us a little bit to why are we here? Why are we in this kind of one of the environments within the game? Um, because I do think that the, as I mentioned before, the environments in which uh, architecture and, and, and computation, computational design have often been non charged of narratives, not charged of social stories or, or kind of accountability for certain, um, some of the issues that we see uh, in the world. And I think that starting to bring computation to a domain where it is charged, it is kind of perhaps a, even in a simulated form, uh, existing within some social struggle, I think that could uh, make a difference. And so we can move through the next few slides a bit more quickly. Um, the setting of the game, as I mentioned, has to do with economic inequality, narratives of dispossession, the post-industrial cities, failed projects of progress, um, who are invited to participate in the table, um, and what are the tools, what are the kind of the paths from, you know, going from nothing to really slowly constructing a, a thriving, can we stop in this slide for a second? Um, a, how, do we, how do we get to design? And in many ways, the, uh, this, this, the tagline of the project has been, how do we design mediated by scarcity? Here I reflect upon how access to materials, access to tools, access to knowledge, and labor, uh, all of them have impacts uh, as instead of thinking of the mechanics of what empowers you, common who really thinks about what are those mechanics that uh, mediate your um, creativity. And perhaps not just mediate it to reduce it, but perhaps uh, steer it in different directions. And so next slide. I wanna believe that the, the uh, designs and, and stories that emerge from within the game are fundamentally entangled with social narratives, right? Um, next two slides. And this is a, a model that it's not very common for video games. Mo uh, video games have often put the player into this God position, in this God mode. Uh, actually, there's a model or, or a, mod, a model for games called the God game, and uh, where, where the player literally plays as a God to transform the world as well. Um, and I think in many ways we are developing with common Huda critique to such, a, such an initiative where the player is, is entangled with the simulation. It's like there's a much more of a push and pull relationship with the simulation as opposed to a commanding role on the simulation. Next slide. Um, there's a large tradition, I'm a big fan of board games and, and there's a big tradition of games also that have to do with worker placement. Uh, and as you can see in the next slide, um, that is also something that happens. Uh, sorry, I think that we, uh, yeah, no, maybe that one. Um, worker placement is also a kind of a tradition that has to do with allocating or resources or looking at labor as a form of human resource. I think that the game really wants to go, kind of go beyond that tradition and start to think what is the relationships that need to be established in a, in a multi-directional uh, and a bi-directional way in, in terms of how a community as a collective really gets organized. Next slide. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, next one as well. Is that the last slide you have? Sorry. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> so we're not far from my ending, but I had like maybe like a few more slides and nothing that I haven't shown already in the video. So maybe you can go back a few slides and we can um, end on some notes on, yeah, maybe a few back. Yeah, this is good. Um, yeah, so um, the game uh, wants to become a social media platform where people can author architectural content, but also share it with others, right? And, and we're trying to work hard on, on developing a, a, an online platform system where people are credited for the work they produce, 
they're owners of the work that they produce, and, and we can contribute to a form of online commons where there could be uh, sharing of content and knowledge, uh, architectural knowledge that could be put at the service of communities worldwide. That means that through the access of a, of a relatively inexpensive video game um, compared to kind of a professional software uh, and through the kind of online collaborations, forums, and platforms that are provided within the game infrastructure, there could be uh, a collective discourse uh, emerging. I mean, at least that's what I'm hoping for. Um, some of the tools that maybe I couldn't show you here uh, have to do with you know, sharing your own designs in the form of a blueprint, uh, sharing that with others. How do someone else like or appreciate uh, what you have produced and how do that kind of knowledge grows over time? Uh, in many ways, uh, that's my ultimate objective is really to to kind of contribute to or help as a form of infrastructure to grow a, a repository of, of solutions that could have a translation into the real world, right? Uh, with Blockhood and um, the first game, there was much more of an attempt to create a diagram uh, of how the city operates and really start reflecting upon ideas of ecology. But with uh, Commonhood, uh, there's certainly more of an attempt to, to take the work into a more realistic setting also uh, more accurately depicting proportions and something that could eventually bridge the gap between the virtual world and the world of architecture. Um, but this time doing it through a, a collective enterprise, something that could have thousands of players engaging and participating, further democratizing what we do uh, with architecture. Um, I usually end, like ending um, on a quote by Donna Haraway, which I really love, especially because it, it kind of, rejects the notion of autopoiesis, which people like Patrick Schumacher and, and certain people in architecture have used in the past. And she introduces the notion of sympoiesis. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm gonna quote here. She says, sympoiesis is a simple world, word. It means making with. Nothing makes itself, nothing is really autopoietic or self-organizing. And I think that those uh, words from Donna Haraway are certainly central to and motivational for, for the work I do with the development of Blockhood, Commonhood, and, and future projects. Um, so I want to leave it there. Uh, I don't have a, a concluding slide, uh, but yes, thank you. Wow, thank you so much. This was an incredible journey that you walked us through, right from the physical spaces of the bloom where children were occupying the structure to the digital life of Neki. It's been quite incredible. I also appreciate how uh, how you've taken the lessons from parametricism and generative design and actually translated it into a platform which can be used by anyone and which leads to this online repository of knowledge. And uh, along those lines, uh, I was actually curious to know that you mentioned this relationship between the human and the computer. And I was curious if the next stage of the project, uh, how the, does the interaction between the computer and the data that has been generated through these games starts to get translated into kind of human aspirations? So are there any kind of patterns or recipes uh, that are starting to emerge from the games and the players that are using it? Um. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, there's, there's a lot of ideas from my side um, about what could happen. I've been mostly dedicated to build the tools for others to use. Um, and the more I get deeper into the, the side of software development, I realize that uh, we ought to be creating Sorry, can you? Uh, repeat it. I think your audio got a bit low. We still can't hear you. Yeah, the thing about it, I think that the more that you open the project up and, and start expanding on who contributes to the project in a way, uh, I think it's connected to the mountain. And actually, you know, in case Instead of the mind, you can see that what could happen. Those things could actually be solved by the computer. Yeah, 
Jose, can you hear me? Jose, can you hear us? We hear you pretty well. We can, I mean, we see you pretty well, but we cannot hear you, sorry. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. now we can. Oh yeah, I don't know what happened there, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. So you were in the middle of answering Vina, Vina's question here. So if you don't mind repeating, that would be great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you can hear me now, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I had gone through like a really long answer already. So no, don't worry. Um, I was reflecting upon a, how sometimes you like, or this happens to me as, a, as, a, as someone developing this tool, that you try to start expanding, continuously expanding on what should happen next and have intuition of what should happen next. Um, but at the same time, I also think that it's important to, to create tools to open the project for others to, to take it and make it their own, right? I think that uh, that intuition at some point become, it, it's blind to what a community can actually really do and what is really meaningful. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm kind of struggling with my own technical inexpertise or like lack of expertise of particular areas. And I think that the idea of opening up the software for others to, uh, to mod it, for instance, there's a kind of a strong modification culture in, in gaming, which I find really spectacular. And I think that that's kind of a next frontier for us to how do, how do you kind of keep an open door for people to do with the software, whatever they want. I could see people connecting it to 3D printing or to kind of DIY initiatives or creating floor plans for architecture, um, but I think that uh, there's always this kind of megalomania of software designers to try to do everything themselves. And I, I, I'm trying to kind of also step back from that um, and, and perhaps just sometimes just playing and really kind of building something with, with these tools and becoming a player in the community. It's for me quite refreshing uh, and kind of stop being this uh, uh, entity that wants to forecast of where this should go, right? I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I cannot say that I have a, a, a perfect picture of where things should go. I think that I'm kind of trying to listen more to what the community would would say and, and, and want to do with the, with the project and put it forward. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it really does answer the question to a certain level in the way that the decision-making process is really put upon everyone and designers are not just trying to take over the entire domain. So thank you for that. Agree. Any further questions? Uh, I have a question about how to use the game to cooperate with the community. I, I mean, your project is trying to construct a design framework that all communities can reach the resource. Is there any possible to use it as a tool to collaborate with the community to increase uh, public engagement in the urban design decision making? And, and another question uh, is that how to use it to replicate the prototype in the game in the real world? and how to use the digital infrastructure to establish a connection across the city that consistently grows. So right. these two right. questions. Right, um, so just as a hint, like the, or kind of a little bit of an anecdote, um, the Blockwood project really started thinking that it would be a dashboard where people would come together have a collaborative session, let's say in a neighborhood and they would be moving pieces around. Uh, you could think of it as a board game or you could start thinking as a digital game. You could think of it as a mixed reality game, right? But it would be like a consensus machine, right? A place in which you would be able to make arguments and say like, look, if we do this, this is the impact of this action. And it wouldn't be so much, or in my mind, it was a sense of like, you could actually reduce the sometimes the bias that certain people might have to a particular idea, trying to simulate the impact or, uh, of a particular move um, so that there would be a conversation, right? That proved to be a lot more difficult uh, 
than it sounds. I think that, uh, or maybe you, you realize that that sounds incredibly difficult to do um, because orchestrating that conversation is certainly uh, challenging and then having a stimulation that could be accurate and, and, and perceive us as neutral, it's perhaps impossible, right? Um, so the game really uh, started to kind of uh, be far more uh, open to the, the pockets or dialogues that would emerge naturally from the community. Uh, I don't have a recipe of how do you take these games to uh, engage with a community directly, like, and there's no kind of literal pathway that we have taken because in many ways we have not done it in a, in a, in a strong formal way. And in many ways, my, my work um, at the University of Michigan wants to go in that direction, uh, especially when uh, Common Food is released later this year, it's really to start putting uh, the test, um, this platform to, to see what can, can actually happen, how can it really engage, um, and, and really kind of giving a voice to sometimes incredible ideas that might come from someone that often might not uh, have a voice in a community, right? Like you, I'm thinking someone perhaps younger, um, but that, that perhaps could actually spend quite a bit of time really trying to kind of create a, a vision for, for something that could have great impact, right? Um, so there's a kind of a, a hopeful kind of aspiration there, um, but not certainly not a recipe. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 don't, I forgot the rest of the question. I don't know if that answered everything or if there's something else that you want me to complement. But I, I hope that the, the future work starts kind of, you know, giving a little bit more of a, a path of how, how these games could actually literally be deployed within a community and, and, and used for participation. At the moment, I am actually um, offering them for, for their kind of free usage in a way in, in, in in, in a kind of a global context, right? In a, in a kind of a online format. Mm, thank you. Thank you, it's very helpful. So we're gonna open up the questions to the audience now. If you like, you can write in the chat or use the raise hand function. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much for for the presentation. It is fascinating to learn about um, what your thought process and agenda is through a video game. I'm, I'm kind of a big video game fan myself, and I find that it's just really fascinating that you're thinking about it really differently about like role playing as an educational method and uh, video games as, as an educational platform. Um, my question is, I looking at the trailer of Common Hood, it kind of reminded me of Minecraft um, a little bit, um, where you try to find your resources and craft them, and you're limited in terms of what you can do based on what you have. But at the same time, like in Blockhood as well, all of it is really constrained to a certain area, right? So it's not an expansive open world, an infinite world like we find in The Sims or in Minecraft. Um, and I, what I understood from there is that it has to do something with density. I know in Blockhood, there's the kind of systems um, operations that you need to think about as you play um, and that you live as a community enclosed in a factory in, in Common Hood. Um, but what else do you think, what else was the thought process behind um, making those areas constrained um, rather, than, rather than an expanded world? Um, I think that the, I think you're right on, on kind of making the comparison with things like Minecraft. In many ways, Minecraft was, you know, <laughs> I was, I remember being a student when Minecraft was kind of starting to become larger and larger. And it certainly was an influence to kind of uh, explore and do research in this direction. So uh, that is certainly um, an influence. Uh, in my case, I guess that the, the idea of scarcity, as I mentioned before, the idea of having to do or design within a framework of scarcity has always been interesting as a designer. Um, not uh, in a way 
the opposite end of that is, is to think about abundance, right? I think that, as I mentioned before, we, we operate in the, in the paradigm of abundance. Um, every modeling software, every software that you've ever kind of opened will, will operate under that paradigm of abundance from the perspective that you have infinite primitives, infinite moves, infinite everything, right? And, and I think that that has a kind of a profound impact on how do we design and how do we you know, envision architecture. And I think that there's been great value to creativity and, you know, and unbounded creativity that comes from abundance. And in a way, also the ideology that anything, if it's, if, if it's interesting enough, or if it's kind of, a, I don't know, wonderful in some ways, or creates enough desire or appeals to commercial interests, it can be built. It doesn't matter what, like, it's all about the, the creativity. And I think that that is not the, certainly true for uh, many people. It doesn't really apply, I think, to everyone. So actually having um, a platform that uh, positions itself from the position of scarcity, so space, your availability for space is scarce. Um, the game, there's a kind of a mechanical answer to that question that the game really slowly kind of introduced you to kind of different sites in which you can build different things and, and it kind of takes you through the game. But it certainly uh, looks at space itself as, as a scarce condition. As a matter of fact, the condition of, uh, you know, uh, the eviction that you start living in and the fact that you don't have access to land and you don't have like in the sims you have like a, a free plot that it's you know no questions asked you you get access to land um, many of the questions that we are reflecting with and, and studying with my students have to do with access to land um, you know I, I really like the kind of the Jeremy Corbyn uh, um, publication called the land for the many which is really a reflection about some of the challenges that we have with land itself and, and the property of land uh, especially when people have more than, um, you know, one or two properties, and then how does this scale? And, and certainly doesn't over uh, a large population. Um, so the issue of scarcity and what is the mentality behind getting in that mindset might be unpopular for some players, um, but I certainly think that it kind of brings some of the interesting dynamics to the project. To to kind of have to be creative, it, it, you have to be. Uh, consider the challenges of scarcity in many ways, right? So uh, yeah, it's, it's a purposeful mechanic. Uh, I think you're right of identifying it. I think it might be, as you perhaps hint, uh, something that might create some friction with some players, but, but in a way, um, Common Hood is, is like Block Hood is a project that has, you know, as a first and foremost, um, it's a project that, that has certain research agenda behind it as well. So uh, those, those are important issues for me. Yeah, can I jump in? My question is um, goes in a similar direction. I mean, first of all, really fascinating projects. Um, I, I agree with some of the students' questions, trying to look behind the curtain as much um, to understand is can this or should this be a form of engagement strategy where players across all age groups are able to understand consequences in the built environment. And then when you think about um, or the um, virtual realities and you know offices using these tools now today to bring their clients into the built environment and they are literally equipped with tools and per hand click they're changing material to test out all kinds of things so there's a very thin line between virtual reality as a design tool to bring uh, non-designers into your environment to make decisions and then the game as a game because I, I believe the game has an incredible value as a learning environment. And that's also the context of, I think, Kareem's question. Um, I, I very much appreciate your political attitude, if you want to call it like this, or the ideological attitude to say there are um, boundaries because within the bound, the boundaries are actually fostering maybe invention rather than the wasteful consumption of land. I also think the last new prototype that isn't released yet had a very strong emotional component. I, I really thought I was standing behind the main actor and I thought I can feel what she's feeling. It had a lot to do with the atmosphere, the lonesome fire at the end. So there was some sadness in the scene, 
that I think was really captured. And I'm wondering if talking about learning environments that, for example, if, if you could allow players to make mistakes, for example, by consuming way too much energy and way too much this and that, and then causing an apocalyptic situation or scenario in the game, because I think, for example, we need to understand the consequences of our today's actions or the fact that we don't change our behaviors much more in the context of climate change. So did you think about something, um, you know, the drama that a game like this can uh, include, that this might be also an powerful learning environment to understand climate change? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that you're, you're I don't want to spoil the story of the game because the story is a, it's an important part of common good. And in, in many ways, when I started doing software, I always thought, you know, I don't care about narrative. I don't think that this is a medium like there, there's about, you know, combinations and variables and kind of uh, all these possibilities. But uh, in many ways, narrative has really become the vehicle to address some issues that are uh, difficult to grasp just through the numbers within a simulation, right? Um, so, so I talk about care uh, in the game. Uh, the, the player in many ways is creating this community and there is a the narrative, uh, there's constantly asking of why do you take decisions? And who is, who is to be taking the decisions? What is the responsibility? And the player, the main character in the game, uh, it's, it's going through a story where she feels that uh, she might be falling through the same errors that a previous generation went through. Um, and the game will give you some open doors to, to fall into some traps, right? Into, into fall into some of those kind of trajectories and, and see the consequences of that. Um, some of the precedents that are uh, certainly uh, in my mind, uh, for instance, there was the Oakland fire where, where a series of people got caught in the fire, a, a group of artists just living in a, an abandoned warehouse. Um, in a way, this is not fundamentally a utopia. There is some serious consequences and there's a sense of a, not really having another option, right? Um, so I think that the, the, being able to convey that to the player and a sense of responsibility and a sense of a care and, 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 and worrying a little bit about making things right within this kind of precarity of, of the environment is very much what, what the, the game is trying to, to do. And I think it's difficult to express, I guess, as I said, like with an equation or a systems kind of thinking kind of perspective, right? But it's actually done through emotion, and uh, that's where where things that Common Hood didn't manage to, I'm sorry, Black Hood, the previous game didn't manage to do uh, yet. And that was the first project, and and in many ways it couldn't it couldn't go there. Um, but I think in this second project we're being more ambitious on the, precisely that point where characters within the game are not just characters; they're somehow a, there needs to be a bond between the, the player and those characters, right? So that you don't see them as workers that they command and they kind of expand your capability to exploit the territory as many other games do, um, but rather how do they become a crew, a family, right? And then and the sense of care. So things like accidents are things that can happen in the game. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't wanna spoil this story, but there's gonna be moments in which uh, what you're describing, not as a huge apocalyptic uh, condition, but perhaps uh, there's certain paths that have certain consequences, right? So I think that that's very much how the narrative wants to engage some, some emotional tones. And it's certainly, I wanna give thanks to Selma Mutal, who's the composer. <laughs> it's our, she's a, a Peruvian uh, composer um, based in France that has been doing fantastic music for the game. Um, so uh, I've always been, you know, a, trying to connect some of the emotional tones of the game to her music. And, and it's great to have her as part of the team working on the project as well. Great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to playing it. <laughs> I think there was another question in the audience. We have a question from the chat, um, Jiayang Li. Uh, I'm wondering what the role of an architect is in designing a game. I mean, what's the biggest difference between architect and game designers when creating a game like this? Um, well, I think that uh, it's difficult for me to, to kind of uh, talk about a monolithic discipline of architecture or a monolithic depiction of the discipline of video games because video games, maybe there's a, there's a 
and there's certain traditions in video games, especially commercial video games, certain tropes in video games uh, that are kind of fundamentally steered by commercial, you know, success and commercial interest. There's a very powerful, I would say, and ever-growing indie game scene, which is independent games by creators, uh, very diverse creators that 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 in many ways do not operate as a block. So uh, I, I think that those might include people with a kind of certain affinity to to music or you know or movement uh, and different perspectives of the world. So I, I think that the game industry and the games games as a medium are becoming a lot more mature over time to, to really uh, have a, a much larger range of uh, options and, and become more diverse, which I think they haven't. I think predominantly they have been the result of white male uh, software production over, you know, since their inception. So I think that starting to see the diversity uh, and the democratization of the games production has certainly allowed me, for instance, to participate, not being traditionally trained as a computer scientist or anything like that to, to embark on what, what is the journey of producing a video game. And, and I think that even within the discipline of architecture, I, I cannot say that I represent in many ways a, a, a trend of, 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 of interest. I think that Mona was, was mentioning that a mixed reality projects or virtual reality projects, especially with, with corporate interest, are very much attuned to kind of perhaps create engagement or kind of visualize how something might uh, end up looking or costing, right? Uh, so um, some of those projects, you know, are, are already happening perhaps within corporate environments, um, not with a global gaming audience. Um, so I think that there is, there has been, I, I certainly stand upon a, a legacy of, of, of research in video games and architecture, people like, Winnie Mass with the Space Fighter Project, which is a beautiful book that MBRDV did uh, several years back. Uh, Cass Foster Hughes uh, has also done like a great conference called Game Set Match that has been looking at, at, at games. And in many ways, physical games have also been tools uh, for thinking of architecture in, in many ways and simulating in the form of board games or kind of installations that are interactive. So I think that there's a kind of a large range of uh, attitudes uh, and I cannot, yeah, so I cannot say that there is a, a fundamental way in which an architect approaches a game design differently than a game designer. Um, but uh, hopefully my perspective, it uh, uh, gives another kind of, you know, vantage point of what, what is certainly possible with the medium, uh, which is certainly, a, for me, a very exciting medium to explore. I had another small question. Uh, in games, as you mentioned, uh, like one thing that you were strongly uh, advocating for was not to have an economy based model. So you obviously don't have like prizes or like coin system in the game. So I was wondering if there were any other uh, criteria that you had or any things that you were cautious that we don't want to do this or we don't want the users to, you know, take it into some different direction which you are like um, striving against? Yeah, so um, so that was Blockhood. Blockhood didn't have a currency. Actually, I, maybe I, I lied. Actually, I Blockhood has money, but money is one resource or cash is one resource as anything else. It's like as exchangeable as water, electricity, social capital or anything else. So, it actually is it's a channel of communication that particular tiles you know, need, um, but other tiles don't. Um, I'm far more interested on the misuse of tools sometimes, you know, how do people break the tools uh, than how they actually stay within the paths that I've kind of created or the rails, right? So um, when you started describing, it's like, how do you make sure that, you know, uh, what are the mechanisms by which people might not be able to do what you wanted to do? And I'm actually, I think that, especially if you look at issues like emergence and complexity theory, um, which is something that I, I studied, like that's how I started kind of getting into, into programming. There is a series of unexpected events that can cascade into each other and they're, they're basically blind spots for the system or for the system designer in this case. And I, I really enjoy, a, you know, 
realizing that those exist and that that can happen, right? With Bloom, for instance, a physical installation, uh, some of the most interesting kind of creations that ever happened were kind of completely not bound to the rules of the game. Um, and that is very difficult to be done within digital form because the digital rails are a lot more strict than sometimes physical rails. Um, and I think that things like physics and, and things like that are, are often really good uh, tools to, to allow a lot of flexibility in users and therefore kind of giving them the, inviting them to break the rules. Um, but you're right that there is a kind of a thin balance between maybe steering certain activity um, or at least initiating certain activity. Um, so in the case of block hood, um, as I mentioned, if you, if you add a tree, for instance, you start with nothing and there's no channels that are need to be fulfilled. There's nothing that you ought to be doing. But once you add a tree, that tree will basically take around 20 seconds to die. So what's happening behind the scenes is that the tree uh, has its own cycle of consumption. So it will consume water every, let's say, five seconds, right? And every time that there's no water available, that will kind of tick one point or one negative point, if you want and it will take away from its resilience. So there's a resilience meter um, and, a, and a tree might have a resilience of number four. So you slowly kind of go down after five seconds, you tick again. And when you get to zero, the tree dies and you know, decays and ends up like a, like, a, like a dry trunk, right? And, but that analogy of decay, resilience and consumption of resource, in this case, water applies to every tile similarly, right? So you, you, you place a bakery, right? And a bakery will have not just one channel to maintain itself alive, but maybe uh, five or so. Uh, and you're like, well, that's a difficult tile to satisfy. So you need to start, you quickly start kind of creating other tiles that would satisfy uh, those requirements. So in a way, um, yeah, I, I, that, that's what kind of motivates the player to really start going from one tile to the next and the next and the next and so on. So money wasn't required, um, but the, the ecological narrative here, the kind of the, the mechanic of creating that dependency between tiles becomes more important than the upkeep cost of having the money to build a bakery. So if you wanna build 10 bakeries, by all means do so, but those are gonna be decayed and destroyed in, in, in the next few seconds, right? That's what the game kind of polices a little bit the, the, the rules that but it, it imposes an ecological rule, right? One in which there needs to be interdependence between tiles. That's the kind of equilibrium status that, that needs to be fulfilled. Um, otherwise, yeah, things die. Um, so yeah, players usually start their, their kind of buildings die quickly and they realize I have to kind of build a little bit more carefully. Uh, and that kind of disincentivize or it doesn't need to be the kind of the economic cost of something, a motivation or, or, or a constraint. To, to create an ecological interdependence. So I invite you to, to try it. I, I, if anybody's interested on, on trying these games or any of the material that I've been showing today, write me an email. Um, I think I can put my email in the chat uh, so that you could, uh, I can give you a key. Uh, we've always kind of given you know, free educational keys for anybody that wants to try or play the games. There's certainly a, an intention to, to have you uh, play the games as much as possible if you're interested. So that's, I'm gonna type my email. And Common Hood, uh, it's a game that has not been released yet, but mm, in the next weeks, the 15th of April, we're launching a, a free demo as well. So if you're interested in trying that game, uh, we're showing the very first chapter of the story uh, and, and hopefully seeing how people react to that. Um, so yeah, that's, our, that's the current state of development, I guess. So on that note, Jose, is there a planned release date for the, for the game? So, yeah. Yes, um, not publicly announced. We are releasing the game in the fall. So the, the, the game was funded by a company called Kowloon Knights. And I think there was a question in, 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 in what Mona and Maria had set up of, forms of funding. I'm working with a funding company that um, supported the, the project and we have funding until 
the fall. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you exactly the day we haven't defined it. We, we need to go through a process of approval. There's a few things that need to happen in order to kind of announce fully the final date. Uh, but it's certainly within this year, uh, somewhere around November, I would say, hopefully. Hi, Jose. Thanks for coming and sharing your fantastic work with us. Uh, so when you show your the common hold construction and uh, animations, I noticed that the players can actually know the beam size, like the 10 feet with the uh, with the height of it. Uh, it looks like this game is project the same um, scales with our real world. So I'm really curious about any difference between design uh, of the vertical world or and the real world for like for architecture and urban designers. Uh, would you please share some takeaways from the vertical space design? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're you're absolutely right. The game it's using a real one-to-one -one scale. And within the game, you start with a table so that you can cut, you know, standard pieces of, of, of timber, like four by four, four by two, four by eight, trying to kind of use like one of the books that I use for, for reference, which I really love the tiny house community uh, or the kind of tiny house initiatives within the DIY culture. And there you can buy these kind of very inexpensive booklets that are kind of blueprints of how to do your own tiny house, right? And the way they kind of show you like, really putting like standardized timber together. Uh, how do you kind of build systems and the electric, like basically the architecture uh, communicated from for a non-architect, right? And I think that the game tries to kind of use a lot of that culture uh, to, to think of a blueprint, not as a plan, as a final drawing, but perhaps as a, as a sequence of actions over time. Uh, as an instructable, the way in which Lego also shares and teaches kids how to kind of build your Legos. It is a kind of a sequence, step-by-step -step process or a little booklet. Um, so that's kind of a, one of the things that we do within the game that you, we give you these blueprints, the game that you, you're playing and you get this blueprint and it's kind of a tutorial of how to build something specific and then players can create blueprints for other players and so on. Um, there is a fundamental difference between the real world and and what you can create in the game. So you can actually, in the game, you can make a beam out of a column, right? Without really kind of figuring out that joint or figuring out the kind of the structure of that. Um, so there might be creations that might be very difficult yeah, and, and definitely impossible in the real world. Uh, so I've been, you know, really struggling of figuring out how to get an approximation. How do even, maybe there's certain items that could be flat. I mean, these are kind of, I'm thinking out of, in the fly right now, but but I've been really thinking about how certain constructions, maybe if they get built in the real world, they could be flagged as like proven or or, or kind of you know had some form of uh, demonstrability that there there could be you know they could be actually built because they're operating within certain uh, even further constraints of uh, you know uh, realistic constraints for architecture. Um, the game might, might need to go a bit deeper into what is joinery in terms of like nail screws, kind of fixtures, all sorts of different details in architecture. So um, as much as we have the scale right, uh, there's certainly more work to be done on, on, on the detailing. Uh, but I'm optimistic that some of those things could be circumvented if, if uh, someone has kind of a sense of uh, um, architectural thinking or kind of is, is, the, is determined to kind of use this tool for 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 real architecture in a way uh, it can certainly be deployed for that right so it might not be the all creations are buildable but certainly some of them and hopefully some of them will really kind of come out of the world of the game and, and become a reality okay it's always difficult to wrap up uh... Good conversation and a fantastic lecture. I think we are all left with, um, for sure, the curiosity to jump in and, and learn more about the game. I'm particularly fascinated by many of the agendas that your work is um, making, you know, quite you know, straightforward and easy to access. 
I think there's an urban stewardship in, in you know, all the work, your book, and, you know, the different iterations of the game, this, you know, this idea about better understanding and better contributing to the creation of something, you know, magical, or, you know, cities and the spaces we inhabit. But there is also, I think, a radical um, social agenda that is trying to remind us that as architects, we are shaping the world but we are also political agents and there is a lot that we can do to make uh, some of these really, really deep um, conversations about, you know, the asymmetry in the re distribution of resources and, you know, the opportunities to, to better redistribute um, very real and very attainable through the discipline, through our capacities as, as designers and as architects and landscape architects, as planners, and I think that is what I, you know, one of the many things that I find really radically um, refreshing in, in the project. This is what we as designers can offer back to the world. And there is, you know, something very powerful that I think is going to be resonating with us. This is about gaming, all the injustices in the world, but it's also about bringing our tools and our capacities to the forefront on what we can do. So it was a real joy to have really you today. Your and Thank you so much. Please um, join me applauding uh, Jose again. And hopefully we will be watching, the, watching and playing the game and learning more and more about your work.